I'm Jacob McDonough, founder and portfolio manager of McDonough Investments. I manage a concentrated portfolio of stocks for clients in a separately managed account structure. In this episode of the 10K Podcast, I'm going to go through the 1920 annual report for the General Motors Corporation. There wasn't too much to discuss from the 1919 annual report, but before I move on to 1920, I want to talk about a few interesting developments in 1919, though. GM invested in the Fisher Body Corporation and internally formed the General Motors Acceptance Corporation, better known as GMAC. Little happened with these two businesses in 1919, but they would go on to be important investments for General Motors in the years to come. I'll talk more about that later. This is what the 1919 annual report said about Fisher Body. Your corporation was fortunate in assuring an enlarged supply of bodies through the acquisition of a majority interest in the Fisher Body Corporation, Detroit, Michigan, the largest builder of automobile bodies in the world. The Fisher Body Corporation is expanding its Detroit facilities, thereby assuring your corporation an adequate supply of bodies, particularly of the closed type, demand for which is increasing rapidly. The item notes payable account of Fisher Body Corporation stock purchase, shown on the balance sheet, represents the balance due on account of this purchase and matures over a period of five years. The total cost, $27.6 million, of the above stock is included in investments. End quote. GM acquired about 60% of Fisher Body, which is why it was classified as an investment on the balance sheet. They paid $27.6 million, financed mostly with debt. The balance sheet at the end of 1919 showed a note payable of $21.8 million related to the Fisher Body investment. In 1926, GM acquired the rest of Fisher Body. Later in the report, GM mentions that they formed GMAC. Management wrote that early in the year, the General Motors Acceptance Corporation was organized to assist dealers in financing their purchase of General Motors products and also to finance, to some extent, retail sales. The gross business done by this corporation in 1919 exceeded $20 million. So what they mean here is it sounds like mostly what they had in mind was to finance dealers purchasing product from GM. Um, But they also had in mind retail sales, which means, you know, the end consumer, the driver of the car, who shows up to the dealership ready to to buy a vehicle. A little bit random, but GM also acquired Frigidaire in 1919, which is still a large manufacturer of refrigerators even today. General Motors ended up selling the subsidiary decades later. When you open up the 1920 annual report, one of the first things you'll see is that Billy Durant is no longer president. This was his second exit from the company, and Pierre Dupont is now the president. Walter Chrysler has also gone from the board of directors. Management discusses the growth of the automobile industry and compares it with other American industries. I'm going to start off by reading some of the early pages of the report. Detroit, Michigan, March 26, 1921. To the stockholders, the annual report for 1920 of the General Motors Corporation would be incomplete without a brief review of the history of the automobile during past years, as the progress of those years may prove an index of future development. The automobile industry is new in every sense. Records show that the first garage for the storage and repair of motor cars was opened in Boston, Massachusetts in the spring of 1899. In that year, the investment in the industry was $5.8 million, with a production of 3,700 cars. While in 1919, the investment was estimated at $1.8 billion in the car production at just under $2 million, a 300-fold growth in capital during the 20 years, and a 500-fold increase in cars manufactured. The number of persons employed in 1899 is not available, but in 1904, there were 13,333 employees with annual wages of $8.4 million. In 1919, the number of employees had risen to 651,450 and salaries and wages to $813.7 million. In 1920, 
the value of the 1899 production of cars was $4.8 million, and that of 1920 was $2.1 billion. The importance of the industry is shown by comparison with the value of the annual production of other lines. So the car industry produced $2.1 billion worth of cars, and then they go down the list and compare other industries to it. Uh, so next in the list would be men and women's clothing at just under $2 billion. Then next we have coal, hay, building expenditures, metallic minerals, wheat, cotton and cotton seed, pig iron, all the way down to petroleum at just $775 million. So everything I mentioned there, the car industry exceeded the production of those industries. So one thing that came to mind for me is that the in investing public seems to get excited about high demand in an industry, but unfortunately that also leads to high supply and high investment, which means high competition. And that can make certain industries brutally competitive. And why that came to mind is, is how they talked about the, in the investment in the industry was very small, negligible, you know, in 1900, but then $1.8 billion of investment in 1919. Uh, that's a major change. Back to the annual report. It is estimated that there are now 9.2 million automobiles registered in the United States. These vehicles are serviced by 178,000 dealers, charging stations, garages, and repair shops. The total registration and driver's license fees paid in the United States in 1920 were over $81 million. The states and counties of the United States have recently authorized $635 million worth of bonds for road construction. $391 million bonds are passing through process of authorization, and the federal government has appropriated $200 million toward road construction, making an available fund of over $1.2 billion for this purpose. When one realizes that the motor industry started not more than 20 years ago, the position now occupied is a great tribute to its stability and worth. It warrants the expectation that it will soon be firmly established as one of the greatest factors in economic development. The history of the General Motors Corporation parallels, in a general way, the greater development. While complete annual reports were not issued until the year 1912, the comparison of the corporation's statement as of the 31st of July of that year with the statement of the December 31st, 1920 report after a lapse of eight and one half years sufficiently reveals the great progress that has been made. Thus, we find the following comparative items. They show networking capital went from 20.7 million up to 144.6 million. CapEx charged to plants and investments went from 2.1 million in 1912 up to 79 million. Fixed assets and plants went from 19.3 million up to 248.8 million. Miscellaneous investments, less than a million in 1912, all the way up to almost 68 million. Goodwill and patents was 9.8 million in 1912, up to 22.4 million in 1920. The corporation has not grown by the issue of securities only, for during the period from 1912 to 1920, there has been invested out of earnings $128.1 million, as shown in the table on page 9, and the corporation has received in cash through sale of securities, largely on stockholders' rights, $130.8 million, a total cash capital paid in of $258.9 million. It is encouraging that the accumulated earnings and the cash subscriptions of new investors have added so largely to the corporation's development showing on the one hand strength and earning capacity, and on the other, faith of the investing public in the stability and prospects of the industry. End quote. I have to jump in and say I disagree with that last part. Management is saying they raised $130.8 million through issuing stock, and that that is great because it shows faith of the investing public in the stability and prospects of the industry. It doesn't really matter what other people think, that shouldn't affect you at all. It doesn't matter whether or not others believe in you and your company. Either way, you just have to go out there and execute. When you issue stock to raise capital, you're selling off a piece of your business and diluting your ownership. If your business is so great and you love owning it, then you should be mourning the loss of that ownership stake you sold, not praising the fact that you sold it. In this case, General Motors had little choice, though, 
The car business is capital intensive. And if the firm wanted to grow, they needed more capital. A business that can finance its own growth through retained earnings is a much more attractive business. Anyways, back to the annual report. The growth of the business of the corporation is further reflected in the increased production of cars and trucks. In the year ending July 31st, 1912, 50,000 units were produced. In the year 1920, over 401,000 units. The increase in number of employees is another indication of growth. At the height of the manufacturing season of 1911, 11,474 were employed in the factories. In the season of 1912, this had risen to almost 17,000. In the height of the manufacturing season of 1920, the total employees had risen to 97,376. This comparison of the annual production of car and truck units and number of employees is of interest. Although the amount of labor per car has undoubtedly decreased, the large proportionate increase in the number of employees reflects the added stability of the corporation brought about by the manufacture of many of the parts and accessories that were formerly purchased in the general market. On the latter point, the General Motors Corporation has made distinct and valuable progress. End quote. So GM has become more efficient as the amount of people it takes to make a car has gone down. The number of units sold has increased eight times since 1912 while they are employing 5.7 times more people than in 1912. It's also not an exact apples-to-apples -apples comparison. As GM mentioned, they manufacture many of the parts and accessories that were previously uh, purchased from suppliers. This means they probably have become a little more efficient than just the labor per car figure would show. Back to the annual report. The present position. While in the year 1912, Few of the component parts of the automobile were made by the various divisions. In the year 1920, all of the engines used in the corporation's cars were produced in its own factories, and they say, complete facilities in these special lines of manufacture have become an integral part of the corporation. They go on to say that General Motors Corporation is a producer of the greater part of its requirements of accessories. In the year 1919, a controlling interest was acquired in the Fisher Body Corporation, the largest manufacturers of high-grade automobile bodies. This company is fully equipped not only for the construction of bodies, but also for components thereof, such as plate glass and hardware specialties. The Fisher Body Corporation is about to commence operations in its new factory at Cleveland, Ohio. It is not possible to state accurately the percentage of parts of an automobile manufactured by General Motors Corporation, but the field has been developed to ensure an ample supply. Such additional quantities as may be needed can be purchased to advantage so that no further substantial investment in facilities for the manufacture of parts will be necessary at a nearby date. The officers and directors of the corporation have thought it unwise to undertake the production of materials that do not relate largely to the automobile. Thus, a comparatively small portion of the total tires produced are consumed by the automobile manufacturer, the larger percentage being sold directly to users of cars for replacement purposes. The greater part of the production of sheets and other forms of steel is consumed by trades other than the automobile industry. Therefore, investment in these fields has not been made. By the pursuit of this policy, General Motors Corporation has become firmly entrenched in lines that relate directly to the construction of the car, truck, or tractor, but has not invested in general industries of which a comparatively small part of the product is consumed in the manufacture of cars. End quote. So the main point here is that vertical integration was an important aspect of General Motors, but the company didn't need to do everything themselves. As I mentioned, they avoided manufacturing tires because a small percentage of the tires produced actually go to a new car. Tires are mostly sold as replacement when a driver gets a flat tire or something like that. The production of steel is another area GM avoided, as other industries use far more steel than the automobile does. This policy makes sense. Manufacturing in-house a part that is exclusively used in the production of an automobile, that is important, as there is less of a market for it and GM needs to secure its share of the supply at a good price. 
the steel industry was already a developed industry with a market of its own. So GM wasn't going to be able to go in and compete on cost with U.S. steel and probably had little worries about securing enough supplies. Revenue increased by 11% in 1920 for General Motors. The report says that their net income was $93.2 million, but what they're really referring to is pre-tax operating income. The after-tax net income to common shareholders amounted to $32.1 million, down over 40% from the previous year. They deducted expenses from that pre-tax operating income figure for items such as taxes, inventory write-downs, depreciation, and for, quote, amounts written off in connection with operations conducted by the corporation pursuant to its policy of assisting employees to buy and own their own home, end quote. The company actually built houses and sold them to employees at cost. Federal taxes only amounted to $3.9 million, though, so the majority of the deduction was from write-downs. As you read further in the report, GM states that they wrote off $25.8 million of inventory. Management wrote that the motor car business, in common with other lines of manufacture, suffered acutely from the conditions which obtained during the last four months of the year. The demand for the corporation's products, which had been very urgent during the first part of the year, was sharply curtailed in September. Inventories reached their peak about the middle of October, end quote. When management says that the demand for their products was very urgent, I interpret that to mean that the car companies were trying to produce as much as they can. And throughout their history, really, their main concern was, can we produce enough to keep up with demand? When management says that inventory peaked in October, it reached $209 million at that time. This was an increase of over 60% above the level of inventory from the previous year. There was a big drop in demand all of a sudden in the auto market, and GM had a cash problem. Remember, this was an industry that was used to growth and worrying about not having enough production capacity to keep up with demand. Car makers were slow to realize that they had to temporarily stop making cars. The firm had to borrow $83 million in short-term debt in 1920 to try to get through their predicament. In the last few months of 1920, GM was able to reduce inventories by $25 million, which helped ease the burden slightly. GM also had $47.6 million of cash by the end of 1920, slightly reducing its net leverage. Still, this was a tough time, though. Here's what Alfred Sloan wrote in his book about this time period. At the close of the year 1920, the task before General Motors was reorganization. As things stood, the corporation faced simultaneously an economic slump on the outside and a management crisis on the inside. The automobile market had nearly vanished, and with it, our income. Most of our plants and those of the industry were shut down or assembling a small number of cars out of semi-finished materials in the plants. We were loaded up with high-priced inventory and commitments at the old inflated price level. We were short of cash. We had a confused product line. There was a lack of control and of any means of control in operations and finance, and a lack of adequate information about anything. In short, there was just about as much crisis, inside and outside, as you could wish for if you liked that sort of thing. We were not alone among automobile companies. Others were also in trouble. That was no particular comfort, for economic declines have a way of shaking out the weak ones in business, and we had weaknesses. Some people cannot see beyond a slump, but I have never yielded to economic pessimism and in times of decline have kept in mind the eventual upturn of the business cycle and the long-range dynamics of growth. Confidence and caution formed my attitude in 1920. We could not control the environment or predict its or predict its changes precisely, but we could seek the flexibility to survive fluctuations in business. End quote. I love that end of that. That quote there, we could not control the environment or predict its changes precisely, but we could seek the flexibility to survive fluctuations in business. You can't predict the future, but you got to stay flexible because there's always going to be fluctuations in business. That's a great line there by, by Alfred Sloan. By the end of 1920, inventory was down to $164.7 million. This reduction of inventory from $209 million 
down to 164.7 million, was partially due to the $25 million worth of inventory GM liquidated or sold, but also from another $25.8 million write down of inventory. This write down was just an accounting entry and not any indication of an improving working capital or cash flow profile. Still, GM was able to improve its inventory situation slightly by the end of 1920. The 1921 annual report shows that GM was able to reduce its inventories by another $55.9 million, directly leading to the company being able to pay off $33.1 million of debt. Management stated that the outstanding feature in the report for their operations of the year 1921 is liquidation. Liquidation forced by the sudden contraction of business to an abnormally low level throughout the United States in face of declining values. The accomplishment of this liquidation in orderly manner is a tribute to American industry and the officers and employees of General Motors Corporation are to be commended for their effective work in the liquidating program. The corporation met the shock of abnormal retrenchment and stood it well. The outlook is now brighter, end quote. Profits turned negative at GM in 1921. The problems originated from the slowdown in demand in late 1920, combined with the slow reaction by General Motors and their subsidiaries as they failed to cut down on production and purchase commitments, and instead allowed inventory to pile up. I mentioned that the company wrote down $25.8 million worth of inventory in 1920, but they wrote down an additional $16.6 million of inventory in 1921. On top of that, GM had $13.8 million worth of expense for refunds to dealers, costs on cancellations of commitments, rebates, and other miscellaneous expenses. They also took a special reserve of $14 million to cover anticipated losses and unforeseen contingencies. These write-downs and extraordinary expenses led to the company reporting a net loss of nearly $45 million. It is interesting how quickly an industry and a business can go from growth and optimism down to liquidation and contraction. Things can change quickly. Elsewhere in the 1921 annual report, GM noted that in 1920, the country was on the eve of a period of depression and liquidation. This was a test for the young and rapidly growing car industry. Management writes that the industry held up pretty well. Vehicle registrations increased by 13%, and the domestic consumption of gasoline increased by 6%. Management wrote that the generally depressed conditions did not result in disuse of the automobile as a means of transportation. It is interesting to think back to this time period, as it is hard to imagine people not constantly using their cars in the U.S. today. Car use is ingrained in the daily routine of most adults in the U.S., Back in the early days of the automobile industry, some questioned the role that the car would play in the lives of Americans. Was it a fad? Was it a luxury item that could be cut back during tough economic times? Eventually, consumer behavior proved itself in the U.S. as people loved their cars and their use became ingrained. Even though GM seemed to weather this storm within a year or two, this was still a crisis for the company. The automobile industry was in rapid growth mode. Manufacturers were more used to worrying about not being able to produce enough to keep up with demand. Leaders of car companies had little experience so far in demand coming to a halt so quickly and to such a degree. The company kept producing cars at a high rate despite the drop-off in sales, and they kept entering into commitments to purchase parts and components from suppliers. GM was a little slow in recognizing the problem, which led to inventory growing on the balance sheet. In the 1922 annual report, management discussed this difficult situation further. Basically, management is saying that working capital was far higher in 1920 than in 1922, despite the fact that they produced far less cars in 1920 than in 1922. Management wrote that, At the close of the year 1920, the net working capital, exclusive of notes payable, in use prior to the write-off of inventories, was $242.8 million, or $116.4 million above the amount required in December 1922 to carry more than double the production of the earlier period. This made it necessary to borrow a maximum 
of $83 million on October 31st, 1920. The reduction of the surplus materials purchased at high prices and of inventory and other commitments made prior to December 1920 resulted in a total liquidation loss of $85 million. This condition of affairs was not reached without anticipatory warning. In the month of March 1920, the President presented to the Executive Committee a schedule of proposed production made possible by the construction and expansion program, then well on toward completion. He proposed that this schedule be adopted for the year August 1920 to August 1921. Though approved at the time, the schedule was revised in the month of May 1920 to a proposed production almost identical with that enforced during the last nine months of 1922. At this early date, May 13, 1920, the Executive Committee and the Finance Committee noted the continued increase of inventories to just under $168 million at the time. The Chairman of the Finance Committee explained fully to those in charge of operations of the corporation the necessity of control, and at his suggestion, a committee was appointed to a lot among the divisions of the corporation, the $150 million considered available for inventories. The chairman also stated that it was necessary not to increase inventories beyond this amount during the succeeding 12 months. The report of the Inventory Allotment Committee was presented and approved before June 1, 1920. It was unfortunate that the rulings of the Executive and Finance Committee and their cautions remain unheeded. As a result, inventories reached a total of $209 million at the end of October 1920, exceeding by $60 million the allotments of the Executive and Finance Committee and by $100 million the amount in actual use during the active summer of 1922. This excess accounted for about 70% of the borrowings at the time. It was doubly unfortunate that the spirit of the committee rulings was totally disregarded by a few of the divisions, the losses of which, due to expanded inventories and commitments for the future, amounted to $48.6 million, or much more than the total operating deficit of the whole corporation during the year of 1921. The operating losses of these divisions during the liquidation and reconstruction period of 1921 added $15.3 million dollars making a total of $63.9 million on their account. Though the losses above enumerated were enormous, it should be fully realized that they were not typical of the operations of the corporation as a whole. In fact, they related to 10 divisions only out of a total of 34. The sales and profits of the 24 normally operated divisions are shown below in Group 1. The sales and profits of the 10 unsatisfactory divisions are shown in Group 2. Of these 10, five were of small importance and were liquidated in 1921. Another, the Samson Tractor Division, is dealt with separately. The remaining four divisions of Group 2 have since been restored to more normal conditions and to an earning power in line with the divisions classed as Group 1. End quote. So basically what the chairman is saying is that the board, the executive committee, everybody set an inventory limit of $150 million. The subsidiaries blew past that, didn't listen to, um, to management, and got inventory up to $209 million. So not only did they blow by the maximum amount set by management, they blew by that by $60 million. They also proved they are able to operate in 1922 with far less inventory, $100 million less inventory. So all of this lack of restraint accounted for 70% of their borrowings at this time, all this excess inventory which was a very dangerous position to be in. Short-term borrowings, heavy short-term borrowings for inventory that was, you know, sitting there idle and maybe high-price inventory, high-price purchase commitments. This was a major problem. I find it funny that management blames the loss on 10 divisions out of 34. Usually a management team might say something like, we would have been profitable without this one unique item. Here, Mr. DuPont is saying, without these 10 divisions, things would have looked pretty good. The other 24 did all right. I guess that just seems pretty arbitrary to me. Management goes on to say that they got out of the tractor business, which produced losses of $11.9 million from 1917 to 1920. They just couldn't compete on price with other tractor manufacturers. 
Management goes on to close their discussion on the 1922 annual report with, The purpose of the above recital is to show definitely that the troubles of past years were not related to an ill finance expansion program or to delay in receiving the proceeds of financing. It is quite certain that the funds provided before the close of the year 1920 were sufficient to carry out the whole program and also to finance new business offered during the year 1921 and the first half of the year 1922. It is equally certain that the disregard for control of inventories and purchase commitments cost the corporation a very large sum of money of which the greater part might have been saved by proper safeguards and divisions, now differently managed. Further, it is important to the stockholders to know that the financial misfortunes of the corporation in the past were only slightly related to the manufacture and sale of its products, but that these misfortunes were directly related to loose and uncontrolled methods, which are now corrected. End quote. Management blames poor inventory controls and purchase commitments. Again, they were slow to respond to a slowdown in the market. GM was decentralized and management had trouble convincing its divisions and business segments to listen to their warnings about the storm on the horizon. Back to the 1920 annual report, though, as a few more things caught my eye. First, management wrote that the rapid development of the industry has called for equally rapid changes in the character of manufacturing plants but by constant reinvestment and rebuilding, the General Motors Corporation has kept well in advance, end quote. This quote is another reminder of the difficulty of the auto business. Large investments in capital expenditures are needed, but even then, much of your historical investment will eventually be outdated. For a business owner, the words constant reinvestment and rebuilding should send a shiver down your spine. Later, management writes that, Constant change has necessitated careful study of customers' demands and possible improvement in the character of the product, end quote. The automobile industry has seen constant change through innovation, and customers' tastes change along with it. As we will see in future reports, General Motors did a good job of responding during this time period to changes in consumer demands. Ford, on the other hand, did not respond as quickly. This was one reason Ford lost what appeared to be a dominant position in the industry. This time period was the peak of Ford's domination in the automobile industry. In 1921, Ford had about 60% market share, while its competitors in the low price field, Chevrolet, had about 4% market share. Henry Ford was able to buy out his minority shareholders, leading to the Ford family owning 100% of the Ford Motor Company during this time period. Here's what Alfred Sloan had to say about this time in the car business. The core of the product policy lies in its concept of mass producing a full line of cars graded upward in quality and price. This principle supplied the first element in differentiating the General Motors concept of the market from that of the old Ford Model T concept. Concretely, the General Motors concept provided the strategy for putting Chevrolet into competition with the Model T. Without this policy of ours, Mr. Ford would not have had any competition in his chosen field at that time. In 1921, Ford had about 60% of the total car and truck market in units, and Chevrolet had about 4%. With Ford in almost complete possession of the low price field, it would have been suicidal to compete with him head on. No conceivable amount of capital short of the United States Treasury could have sustained lo the losses required to take volume away from him at his own game. The strategy we devised was to take a bite from the top of his position, conceived as a price class, and in this way, build up Chevrolet volume on a profitable basis. In later years, as the consumer upgraded his preference, the new General Motors policy was to become critically attuned to the course of American history, end quote. So the plan was for Chevy to take a bite from the top of Ford's position. What Sloan means here is that GM hoped that Chevrolet could fill a niche in between the low price field and the middle price field. Chevrolet couldn't compete with Ford on price with a comparative vehicle. What they could do is offer a little more to consumers than the Model T at a little bit higher of a price and hope that some customers were willing to pay to upgrade. Similarly, they also happened to take a bite out of the bottom of the middle level as well. In that case, they offered a little bit less features or quality than the middle price level, but maybe they could entice some customers by offering a lower price. 
Again, they were looking for a niche, a small group of customers who didn't fit exactly into the categories that existed in the automobile industry at that time. This strategy ended up being successful. This allowed General Motors and Chevrolet to build up some scale to their operations while still operating profitably. Slowly, over time, they were catching up to Ford in the Model T in terms of its scale and its cost advantage. The car industry transformed in the 1920s. Sloan does a great job of summarizing the changes that occurred. He wrote that, As the economy, led by the automobile industry, rose to a new high level in the 20s, a complex of new elements came into existence to transform the market once and again and create the watershed which divides the past from the present. These new elements include installment selling, the used car trade-in, the closed body, and the annual model. End quote. This brings up another important story, which is the fact that GM was quicker to adopt closed body cars, unlike Ford. The acquisition of Fisher Body Corporation that I mentioned earlier helped General Motors in this aspect. Here's what Alfred Sloan had to say about the situation with closed bodies. The rise of the closed body made it impossible for Mr. Ford to maintain his leading position in the low price field, for he had frozen his policy in the Model T and the Model T was preeminently an open car design. With its light chassis, it was unsuited to the heavier closed body, and so in less than two years, the closed body made the already obsolescing design of the Model T non-competitive as an engineering design. Mr. Ford, nonetheless, put closed bodies on the Model T and sold 37.5% of his production in this form in 1924. Although the market for closed bodies rose sharply in the next three years, he sold only 51.6% in 1926 and only 58% in 1927, while Chevrolet's sales of closed bodies during that period rose to 82%. I believe he means 82% of Chevrolet's production was closed body. From 1925 to 1927, the Chevrolet, as its cost position justified a lower price, became more competitive with Ford as we had hoped. The Chevrolet two-door coach, going in that period progressively from $735 to $695 to $645 to $595, while the Ford two-door Model T went from $580 in 1925 to $565 in June 1926 and to $495 in 1927. Thus, the old strategic plan of 1921 was vindicated to a T, so to speak, but in a surprising way as to the particulars. The old master had failed to master change. Don't ask me why. There is a legend cultivated by sentimentalists that Mr. Ford left behind a great car expressive of the pure concept of cheap, basic transportation. The fact is that he left behind a car that no longer offered the best buy even as raw basic transportation. It was not difficult to see in 1925 and 1926 that Chevrolet was closing in on Ford. In 1925, Chevrolet had about 481,000 U.S. factory sales of cars and trucks, while Ford had approximately 2 million factory sales. In 1926, Chevrolet moved up to about 692,000 factory sales of cars and trucks, while Ford moved down to about... 1.6 1.6 million. His precious volume, which was the foundation of his position, was fast disappearing, but he could not continue losing sales and maintain his profits. And so, for engineering and market reasons, the Model T fell, and yet not many observers expected so catastrophic and almost whimsical a fall as Mr. Ford chose to take in May 1927 when he shut down his Great River Rouge plant completely and kept it shut down for nearly a year to retool, leaving the field to Chevrolet unopposed and opening it up for Mr. Chrysler's Plymouth. Mr. Ford regained sales leadership again in 1929, 1930, and 1935, but speaking in terms of generalities, he had lost the lead to General Motors. Mr. Ford, who had so many brilliant insights in earlier years, seemed never to understand how completely the market had changed from the one in which he made his name and to which he was accustomed. That's very common. When you get success, it's very hard to change and move away from what got you successful. You kind of become anchored to 
to what made you successful. In the previous episode, I discussed the 1918 annual report for General Motors. In that episode, I mentioned how Henry Ford was a man who was focused. This fueled his, his success, but would lead to Ford losing its dominant position in the market eventually. Your strengths become your weaknesses. On the other hand, General Motors had a priority of diversity. One of the areas of diversity was in terms of engineering methods and product designs. Here's one example of how that came to really benefit GM. Most cars had open bodies when GM acquired Fisher Body in 1919, yet GM was quick to notice a shifting trend in the industry. In the 1919 annual report, the company wrote about the Fisher Body acquisition saying, thereby assuring your corporation an an adequate supply of bodies, particularly of the closed type, demand for which is increasing rapidly. End quote. This was in 1919. Alfred Sloan notes that even by 1924, five years later, Ford was still behind the ball on closed bodies and that only 37.5% of Ford's cars were made with closed bodies at that time. The Model T was designed for open bodies. Instead of making meaningful changes, it sounds like Ford slapped a closed body on top of a car that really wasn't meant for it. It wasn't until 1927, eight years after GM made their acquisition of Fisher, that Ford shut down their plant and retooled to adapt to the changing product. General Motors identified this trend in 1918, and Ford didn't really get serious about it until 1927. This reminds me a bit of what I said in my podcast about Geico in the 1970s. Management of Geico was slow to respond to difficult inflationary environment that they were in. This really hammers home the fact that constant execution is so important in business. You can execute at a high level for decades, but a few years of poor execution can severely damage your position, at least in a tough business like automobile manufacturing or like the insurance business. You need to be an expert in your industry and just live and breathe it. You need to notice trends, notice the status quo changing, even if you invented the status quo and still benefit from it. If you don't respond, especially in a rapidly changing and competitive environment like the auto business, you will lose out. This reminds me of a quote uh, Tom Izzo said, the head coach of Michigan State basketball's team. He talks about players who like it, love it, or live it in terms of basketball. At first, I didn't really like that quote. I don't know. I didn't like the sound of love it versus live it. But I feel like this, um, this example here really stands out to me. If you live it, if you live and breathe your craft, think you're just bound to notice more shifting trends, changing consumer tastes. I don't think you can be eight years behind noticing that you need to change the Model T uh, to a closed body instead of open body. And in the Geico example, if you're living and breathing your insurance business, you're bound to stay up at night worrying about inflationary forces moving your costs up to an uncompetitive position. I think like it, love it, or live it. If you're like a hired gun, a management team that's brought in, maybe you don't love it or live and breathe the industry. You're just trying to to run the business pretty well before you can reach retirement age and go hit the golf course. I think a management team like that is bound to not execute at the highest level versus like a founder who lives and breathes the product, the business, and the craft. Sloan goes on to highlight how Ford was no longer even serving its original purpose. That is, providing basic transportation at the lowest possible cost. The used car market, which didn't really exist when the Model T was introduced, was now fulfilling that purpose. Sloan wrote that, Go back for a moment to the first 4 million car and truck year, 1923. From then to 1929, setting aside variations in the years, there was a seven-year plateau in new car sales. And yet the total number of cars in use, as I've shown, continued to rise. While the total market, including used cars, expanded, the new car market leveled off. And, as I've said, the role of the new car was to cover scrappage and growth in car ownership. Meanwhile, the used car, at much lower prices, dropped down to fill the demand at various levels for basic transportation. Mr. Ford failed to realize that it was not necessary for new cars to meet the need for basic transportation. 
On this basis alone, Mr. Ford's concept of the American market did not adequately fit the realities after 1923. The basic transportation market in the U.S., unlike Europe, since then has been met mainly by the used car. When first car buyers returned to the market for the second round, with the old car as a first payment on the new car, they were selling basic transportation and demanding something more than that in the new car. Middle income buyers, assisted by the trade-in and installment financing, created the demand, not for basic transportation, but for progress in new cars, for comfort, convenience, power, and style. This was the actual trend of American life and those who adapted to it prospered. It was thus that the four elements with which I began the discussion in this chapter, installment selling, the used car trade-in, the closed body, and the annual model, interacted in the 1920s to transform the market. Jeff Bezos has a great quote, that you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. Henry Ford had a passion for providing basic transportation at the lowest possible price. If this was still his mission, and the mission of his company, then by the mid to late 1920s, the way to go about this might not have been to produce new cars. Maybe Ford should have gotten into the used car business. Maybe they could have revolutionized the car dealership model, started a chain of mechanic and repair shops throughout the U.S., you know, to keep cars running longer, or figured out other ways to prolong the life of each vehicle. There would have been nothing wrong with a pivot like this. There is no shame in switching business models and nothing wrong with running a used car dealership. Maybe Ford could have sold some of its manufacturing facilities to GM or Chrysler to fund this restructuring. Focus is great, and it's what got Henry Ford to the top, but eventually his focus either had to shift or he had to adapt his business to realign with his mission. Henry Ford had a dream of providing affordable transportation to the masses. The used car market, when it developed, it already served this purpose. If Ford wanted to stay stubborn with his dream, that is great. But he needed to be flexible to pivot business models. A stubborn-like focus got him to the top, but being flexible is still important. I forget the exact quote, but I heard Founders Podcast say something like, be stubborn on the vision, but flexible on how you get there. That explains how Henry Ford got to the top with 60% market share in 1921. He failed to stay flexible on how you get there, once he already was there. That was his main issue. Sloan brings up installment selling, or financing the purchase of a vehicle. General Motors was much quicker than Ford in providing financing, and this also fueled the rise of the used car market. This is another shift in the industry that GM was quicker to recognize and adapt to. Remember, GM formed, formed GMAC in 1919, so they were early in recognizing the importance and validity of financing a car purchase. Sloan wrote that, In 1915, about eight years before the automobile industry would become the largest American business in terms of volume of sales, its distribution system had no routine retail credit structure outside of a very narrow banking channel. End quote. Another interesting point about GMAC was that the incentives were aligned between drivers and the car manufacturer. Sloan wrote about this in his book. If loans were made on unfair terms, or if bad loans were originated, it would hurt car companies down the line. Sloan wrote that, The man who pays too little down and takes too long to pay will have no equity with which to come back soon for a new car. End quote. Bankers, as well as plenty of the general public during the early days of the auto industry, thought a car was for sport or pleasure. Originating a loan for luxury seemed like a bad proposition, and consumer credit was seen as too risky during this time period. However, loans at GMAC turned out to perform really well. The Great Depression was an excellent test of this, and I'll discuss how things turned out during the Great Depression in a future episode. Point is that financing a car turned out to be valid and a creditworthy endeavor, yet no bank was fulfilling this need in the market. GMAC was able to fill this gap in the car market. This is an important point. General Motors tried offering other financial products and services over the years, like car insurance, but this didn't work out quite so well. GMAC was successful, though, in providing car loans. 
One reason for this could be that plenty of car insurance companies ended up serving consumer demand for insurance. When GMAC first started out, there was a gap in the market. If banks had been providing this service and making loans, then there would have been no need for General Motors to form GMAC. Compare this to companies like Tesla and GM today trying to enter the car insurance market. Companies like Geico, Progressive, and State Farm already take care of this industry pretty well. I don't see a major gap in the market, at least not like General Motors faced in the 1920s. Tesla might have an advantage in terms of the cost of repairing a car, but insurance companies also incur other expenses outside of their field of competence, like medical-related services. While auto manufacturers like Tesla would understand their car the best, insurers like Geico do understand drivers pretty well. If Tesla keeps growing, that could mean more and more new drivers buying their cars. Tesla might not understand these drivers as well as their competitors in the insurance field, Time will tell, though, if auto manufacturers can enter this industry. That's where I'm going to leave off for this annual report. In the next episode, I'm going to pick back up with the 1932 annual report of General Motors when the company is caught up in the midst of the Great Depression. In the meantime, I'd love to hear any questions or comments from listeners. You can reach me at jacob at mcdonough-investments.com or on Twitter at mcd underscore investments. Thank you for listening.